Hi there, my name's Harry. I'm the CEO of Phaseo, and I am also your host for the Phaseo Connects podcast. So in this uh, first video, we're going to be introducing you to Kalani Ripley, who is the Managing Director of Ripley Dynamics, which is a fully integrated manufacturing facility based on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. So Kalani has been in manufacturing for many years and also from a very young age. He started off working in 3D printing and incrementally built out his skill sets and then therefore his business uh, into both injection molding and 3D printing of both metal and plastic parts. So really looking forward to getting into the details with you guys. One of the things I found on your LinkedIn uh, is you first started manufacturing when you're nine years old um, and you actually released your first product uh, when you're 10, right? Um, yes. So like, what did you do and what got you, was it, what got you into manufacturing in the first place? Oh, well, manufacturing as a whole, but it was really 3D printing that was the entry, right? Uh, I'm a huge nerd. I mean, most people in the industry are, are big nerds about 3D printing and, and manufacturing, additive injection, all that sort of stuff. The people are big nerds about it. And then they usually just try to find a way to make money for it. For me, uh, I sort of got that hook a lot younger than most people. Uh, when I was, I was nine, I was, I was looking up sort of rep wrap uh, and that sort of industry. Um, and the, the beginnings of that open source 3D printing community. I was like, this is awesome. I want one. Uh, and then I went straight to, you know, my, my parents and they said, absolutely not. We're not spending that much on you to build a fire trap in our house. And I was like, okay, fair enough. And then I was getting some parts printed out of the US uh, for competitive Nerf. Uh, so I was playing uh, like Nerf uh, Wars at the okay. time. And, I, and then I went and then I went to paintball. Um, and then so the first parts I was really making were sort of custom handle grips and stuff for, for like Nerf guns and paintball. But then as well as that, I, I then started making... Uh, some car accessories, uh, because back in the day, we could only print ABS or, you know, whippersnipper wire was what I was using, which is ABS-like. Um, and so it was predominantly car accessories and small little trinkets. Um, I actually took it to the markets when I was like 10 and it got kicked out because they thought that it was going to catch fire, which it probably was because, you know, a 10-year-old had wired the electronics. So it was, yeah, that was, that was, it was very, very fast and loose. So you took a you took the riprap design then, and you, you built a riprap, and then had it printing out the 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 whippersnipper wire. Was it? Yeah, it was. It was a uh, Mendel ninety. I oh, sorry, no, no, no. It was okay. a it was a Prusa Mendel. Um, it was back in I, I want to say twenty ten. Um, yeah, well, twenty ten was when the design came out, and then I built it in twenty twelve. Um, so I would have been, yeah, about like nine or 10 around, around that age. That's awesome. um, and it was, yeah, I, I, I had actually, I had gotten a lot of the components from like our local hardware store in Australia, which is called Bunnings. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that was it, like, I was going in there. I was like, do you have six mil threaded rod? And they're like, no. And I was like, what's the biggest, they're like, we have eight mil. And then I realized that it was Imperial. And then that's how I learned what a metric versus Imperial was. So it was a great learning experience on top of learning, you know, basic algebra at school, but it was, it was, yeah, it was really quite weird. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a I, Prusa, I, it, was, it was a Mendel, Rep Rap Mendel. I remember when they came out and um, the, the whole, the, the, um, the meme at the time was that you could use your, you could use your Rep Rap to print another Rep Rap, right? So it was like, yeah. a, it was like an infinite loop. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a very, yeah, it was, that, that was a very cool time. I, that was the first thing I printed was the little Rep Rap uh, infinite loop thing. It was pretty funny. Right. So I'm curious then, would you describe yourself as the, um, as the, would you describe yourself as the, uh, as the geeky hacker or, um, the structured business person? Like, cause, cause you got a bit of both there, right? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, what's the, what's the, like the taco ad where it's like, bueno, los dos, like one or both. Um, <laughs> you know, I, like, I, like I, yeah, I, yeah. I genuinely think that I that I am both, yes. but at the same time, I love working with new stuff. Like literally behind the camera here, I've got silicon in a vacuum, like in a vacuum chamber, because I've was wanted to start learning about how to mold silicon, uh, like for prototyping. Okay. And it's like that sort of stuff is is something where it's like I that business brain, the business sense to buy that vacuum chamber was not there. It was not in the slightest. But the, the, the nerd in me and the, and the, you know, hacker, nerd, geek, whatever you want to call it, like nerds rule the world, uh, you know, that side of me was like, let's buy it. Let's see what happens. Um, and it's sort of one feeds into the other and then it grows. 
right. Buenos los dos, then it is. Because uh, so yeah, yeah exactly. I always, uh, I've always seen you as a kind of a very a very structure oriented and sort of organizational oriented person. So um, I was like. They're, they're two separate worlds, I think, sometimes, and they, I guess they come to, to loggerheads at some, at some point. Um, I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of engineers who struggle to, to get started in business, and then even especially in the world of, of startups, right, you have a lot of, um, a lot of like, very social um, and very like, um, uh, personable people that are constantly looking for, for technical skills. And it's actually quite rare that you find both of those skills in, in one person, I think. Um, so on that note of processes, um, you've got a you've got a four step process in product development. So I'm curious as to sort of what the the birth of this process was, how how you sort of how you sort of found that process, and um, and how you guys apply it at Ripley. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, so the the way the process came about was more so just out of the necessity for uh, our clients when they were coming into us, and and at the time it was just me. Uh, when they were coming to me and going, I want this made. And then, you know, it'd be a little toy. Like, okay, how am I going to make this? I needed, I like my business brain needed structure on how to, how to a quote for it, but also how to, how to set up timelines and timeframes and goals that, that at the time me, but now my team can work towards so that the client or the customer or, you know, whatever you call them, the, the person getting the work done from you knows what, they want and and what they're paying for there so ideation prototyping pre-production and then production right and so you said idea uh, prototyping is really am um then pre-production pre-production is the design work that goes into something like uh an injection mold or something like that and then finally the production is the injection mold itself yeah, so you, so well, more so your pre-production is just a hybrid of all the different technologies. That's when you're really starting to see the, the synergy between sort of old school manufacturing and new school, right? Uh, it, it's a combination of, for, for us at least, you know, if we're doing a, we call pre-production runs, you know, maybe two, 300 units. So you might have something where you're making a high temp uh, resin insert for an injection molding blank tool, uh, uh, sorry, for, for a, a tool. So you go, okay, that's, that's something that you're working towards there where you go, that's technically still pre-production, but you've got 300 units now you can go and test a market with. Uh, and and that's, that's sort of blending those, those technologies where we're using printing and additive in, in sort of the, the injection molding world as well. And then, and then as well as that, you have the synergy of, of using new school with old school technologies. Obviously, 3D printing has been around since the 80s, but there is, you know, it, it's becoming a lot more prevalent in a lot of these older businesses as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned um, some of the molding technologies that you that you're um, that you're working with at the production at the production stage. There, um, so would you say that a lot of the innovation that you guys are doing at Ripley then is really in that in that pre production gap? It's the the ability to the ability to bring um, additive into the pre production in, into the pre production phase, so that you can then you, you're building assets that you can use in production. Yeah. Absolutely. You're saving so much time. They, you know, like you guys would know for every dollar that you're spending uh, in prototyping or pre-production, well, the moment you try to fix something in production, it's going to 10x. It's just, you're saving mm -hmm. so much money. And that's where we come in is because we're special. We specialize in each pillar of the, of the process of, of pre prototyping, pre-production, production, even post-production. Um, there's rooms for additive for jigs and fixtures and that sort of thing. Um, but really where we stand in is, is in that pre-production phase when we're doing the tooling, we're doing the, the prototype tooling, when we're doing you know, th those sort of things. Would you say that uh, if you were to describe the average customer's journey with Ripley, would you say that the journey is the four steps or is there, is there more to it? There, there is more to it because every customer comes into us at a different stage, right? Uh, there's customers right. that come to us when they're, they may already be at pre-production. They might already have a tool and they're, they're going, okay, we need, you know, we, we're having issues with this tool. It's not, it's not cooling correctly. But the full customer experience and what I hope to bring all of our customers through is all the way from ideation, then to prototyping, then to pre-production, then to production. And then eventually marketing and that, but you know, four steps. For the average, it's, it's, so, it's so varied because we don't know where they come in, 
right? We don't, we don't know. Uh, sometimes that like we've had customers that come in when they're already in production and they're already producing tens of thousands of units a year. And they require us to bring their cycle times down because they need to lower their unit cost. And that's, that's where, you know, the, the beauty of additive is it can fill gaps in every single spot of the, of the pipeline. Okay. So across this, this, this four-step process that your customers go through, where would you say you see most of the problems emerge for your customers? Most of the issues will always come from pre-production because that's where you're starting to get your, everything starting to ramp up. You've got to go to pre-production and you're getting ready to produce parts. That's when you need to start thinking about every single external factor because you can, have, you can make the most fancy part in the world on a printer, but how are you going to make it at scale? Uh, and that's, that's where most of the issues come up and that's where most of the ingenuity that we have to try you know, play with comes up. Okay, and that's really why you guys have been investing into this pre-production phase, that bringing additive uh, together with with injection molding to be able to smooth out some of those steps there. Then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's been the biggest part for us. For example, with the with the cycle time, when when they're already producing ten thousand units a year, we need to take this this some this product that's somebody's business and bring it back to pre-production. We have to bring it back a step and go. Let's see. Okay. Let's see where where we can then fix this thing, or or maybe you know maybe we can't. You know that that's another another thing as well. Maybe we have to redo the whole the whole thing. For example, with, when we had to reduce those cycle times, we ended up using a a, a, a metal a tool steel core with a cooling channel down the side, and we improved their cycle time by seventy percent, which means that they're paying seventy percent less for machine time on their their molding machines. Yeah, that, I mean that's massive. I mean, can you imagine if you were if you were producing like 10,000 parts, 100,000 parts or something like that. Like that would, I can imagine that you're talking in the orders of millions, right? That you could, you would be able to, you could shave off of a production. I, I'm not allowed to say, but, but around there, around there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so then can you tell us then a little bit more about um, the use of additive in injection molding? So what's the, what's the specific value add? That can do. So, so the thing with injection molding is that you're limited to a lot of the time what you can mill and what you can can actually cut out of steel. Now you can have the most complicated five axis in the world, uh, but you're never going to be able to beat something that a, a, a SL, uh, sorry a SLM 3D printer can do uh, in you know a couple of days. It's it's just a, a another tool that we've now used in our arsenal to be able to do it. For example, I'll, I'll go back to those, those cooling cores. They had a full and complete spiral uh, inside. So normally like that, you would normally run a baffle down the, down the top of the pin. So it would come up and around and come out. Now, the problem with that is that over time, that core, because you've got to think you're molding it 16,000 PSI and you're molding it 260 degrees for, for some parts, that that core is then going to get really, really hot, even with that limited cooling with the baffle so then the plastic starts to stick to it which means that it can no longer pop off which means you have to increase the cycle time to let that let that uh that part cool on there so we could actually have the the baffle spiral around and come back down so that meant that the 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 water was going to be able to come through and out much quicker than a normal baffle and we actually put that water through a chiller to further in, improve cycle times. And then the, the, it's funny because there's, there's a story I'll get to later, but that cycle time improved by 70% because the whole time of the cycle was actually just it's releasing from that core. So when it could mold around it and it was already cool and the inner part wasn't sticking to that wall, it would pop straight away. So it was a, it was a, a perfect synergy between metal 3D printing and injection and molding. Now, we actually prototyped that tool in a high temp resin on one of our resin machines, uh, that, that core, sorry, in one of our high temp resin, resin machines and shot a couple shots before it blew up. But we were able to actually prototype that again with a high temp resin, shoot it a couple of times, then it you know, melted away because it's still, still resin. And then, uh, and then we were able to verify that. that that's really cool. So, so the, the, the main advantage and additive for uh, producing injection molding tooling is really in its ability to produce extremely complex geometries. Yes, absolutely. Com complex geometries. And then as well as that, the, the 
cost savings when producing those complex geometries because you can mill anything for the right price, but it would have been north of 50, 60 grand. When we can pull it off for you know a couple grand, it's, it's something that is just infinitely uh, more affordable. And it means that it can, it can be spread across multiple tools. Um, and, and something like that, that was actually a four cavity. So it had four cores and then that had about six or seven different parts that are produced. So you can see where the cost starts to add up if you're paying you know, okay. tens of thousands of cores. Uh, are we talking like a, what sort of percentage saving are we talking in production of like a very complex milled core versus a, a very complex additively manufactured core? Oh, you're looking at savings of, of north of 90%. When you when you add wow. all the post processing that comes into it, wow, that's crazy. And, and do you do you? I mean, again, I'm not an expert on injection molding, but um, is there a maximum cycle count for these for these molds? Yes, there is. Uh, but a lot of the time, that's what we we plan for uh, when we're making the tool. So if if something's required to do millions and millions of molds, well, then we'll make that tool accordingly. But if it's only ever going to do fifty thousand shots in its life. You then design it accordingly, um, and that's where that's where, for example, this this part this part with the uh, the cooling channel that has currently, I think, when I last looked at the shot count last month, that's had already over forty thousand shots on it. So that's that's sixty one hundred sixty thousand parts that's been produced on those four cores, uh, and and they're still running perfectly. Right. Okay. So, so you, so rather than simply replacing the cores, you will choose to use different materials that, um, that are, that are more resilient. And so the core can last longer. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, the, that's the beauty of additive as well, right? You've got so much more material choicing than when you were traditionally milling and you're limited by what you may only just be able to get in, you know, at least in Australia, if you're overseas, it's a different thing. But in Australia, you're limited by what you can milk and what your machine allows you. Now, with additive, a lot of our machines, and at least our ones that we use, our machines allow us to chop and choose what materials we're using. Uh, you know, we can be printing aluminium one day and then print, you know, tool steel the following. Okay, nice. So it's, it's basically just extremely flexible for, you could say in many ways, you can reduce the lead time for getting started with injection molding, reduce the cost, and also do more advanced geometries. Is there any, Absolutely. are there any sort of scenarios where it actually makes more sense to use a traditional technique to, 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 build, a, to build a core as opposed to using a, an additive manufacturing? Yeah, absolutely. So for that example, that was a, a very, that was molded in a, in a polyurethane or for, for the additive people out there, it's a TPU. Uh, so that's molded mm -hmm. in, a, in a flexible material so it sticks to stuff. If you're molding that in something like a polypropylene or an ABS or, you know, a harder, more rigid material, you may not need to use that core because your cycle times are, are normal, right? They're, they're, you're able to play with them because the material solidifies. But when you're using complex materials or specialized materials to mold something, um, you'll have to use specialized and, and custom tools to be able to, to get that tool to work correctly. Uh, for example, we're, we're molding, we've got a tool being produced right now in ABS that we could have made a core for that was you know, metal printed, but for us to just put a core on a lathe and turn it, it was only you know, a couple hundred dollars compared to printing a core. And realistically, when you're only producing, say that, that customer was only producing about 10,000 of these parts a year, so the, the cost savings weren't gonna be there for them. But that doesn't mean that you can't save on only 10,000 parts, you may be able to amortize that cost. There's so many different variables that go into it. And that's when you start to just have that conversation and say, let's see what we can do for your project. Because it might not just be a core, it might also be something, you know, you've got a cooling channel around the outer side of a, of a solid half of a mold base. You know, you've got one half that's fixed and then another half that moves in and, and mates with the core. You might have this part that's red hot and this one that's cool. And then you start to get warpage and things like that. So there's so many different applications that we can play with and that we can also prototype for a low cost right in a high temp resin or, or something like that we can we can play with it interesting okay so you, you alluded to something before actually that i wanted to go a little deeper on um, you said that uh, in australia there's um there are certain uh, certain facilities like milling and whatnot that are available that may not be available in other places so could you tell me a little bit about um when it's advantageous to work locally and onshore 
and examples where offshoring may be a more suitable choice. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, a, it's the beauty of it, right, is that when you move overseas, your labor cost goes down. So that's a big proportion of your, of your costings that go away. Now, the, the downside to that is that you've obviously got to implement processes and, and quality checks over the, in those factories, which inherently already happen when you're based, you know, say two, three hours, you know, maximum drive from where your parts are being produced. So if you're local, you're producing parts that are already being QC'd and there's a lot less friction in that supply chain. Whereas when we move parts overseas, you know, I've got a person on staff who he speaks, you know, Mandarin and I've got another one that speaks Hindi. So when we move to say China or India or wherever it may be, or Sri Lanka, when we move over there, we've got people that work as a quality check layer. Now that comes with a cost. So that's where you have to, again, the same way you would with, you know, injection molding cores or, you know, a, a blending of additive and injection molding tooling, you would then have to do that cost benefit analysis on whether or not it is beneficial to you know, hire somebody to work as a quality control layer, or if you do a trip three times a year to your factories, or if you outsource it completely and then just take the hit on the few that you may lose quality on, um, or if it's something that there is such high tolerance, it may be entirely cheaper to just send it all over there. And, and if you have a few duds, your tolerance might, it might be plus or minus one mil. So you've got so much more room in, in, into play. So that's, it it's all comes down to what the product is and the cost benefit analysis around your quality control and your supply chain, how, how fragile that supply chain is. Right. Okay. So you would say then that the majority of the, of the, the difference is really in quality control then? Absolutely. So it's, it, it's quality control and supply chain. So for, for us, where if we've got a product that's made here in Australia and, and you know, like granted, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my office down the Gold Coast, but we're up in our injection molding facility in Brisbane. When, when we're up there in Brisbane, our material supplier produces the material, uh, I think it's 400 Ks away from us. So we, if, if in doubt, and I have done it, I've just driven a car over there, picked up material and come back. It's a bit harder to do on a FedEx plane, right? So it's, it's a different mm. thing when you, yeah. you can't just drive to go pick up material or you can't just, so if it's something where you've got elasticity and you, you may be have 12 months of stock and you can deal with two or three months of, of delays, then it's, it's something where your supply chain is, is a lot more resilient, but especially now with, you know, on-time manufacturing and, and everything coming down to getting stock within a week or two, that's why a lot of, a lot of manufacturing is becoming more localized again. Yeah, okay. actually, that's a, that's a pretty interesting theme there, right? Which is, it's also, it's, it's a, of course, a, um, a relevant theme globally, but in Australia in particular, there's a real push to be able to have more of a software manufacturing capability. Um, and, you know, with you guys, you guys are obviously making investments in, in Australia. Um, is it something that's um, is like? Are you? Is that something that you're seeing growth in that, that you feel a lot of customers are asking that things are made in Australia now? Absolutely, absolutely. Every single customer that I have come through, it's funny. We were talking about the customer journey of, of, of you know what happens in Ripley Dynamics. A customer comes through the door. I want it made in my backyard. I want it made from material made you know up the road. I want this, and then they usually understand that the costs don't always uh, allow that. And then we start to work from there, right? Everybody wants everything made in their backyard. That's very hard to be able to achieve that. So we then work with them and go, okay, let's see where, where we can produce things in Australia. And that's the biggest thing that I've noticed in the past 12 months is that manufacturing is coming back to Australia. But as well as that, you know, in New Zealand as well, I was, I was recently over there in July and we saw manufacturing was, was moving back to New Zealand as well. Whereas 10 years ago, obviously, you know, I was a bit younger back then, but the, the general consensus was to get everything overseas and to reduce your cost. But now that they've seen that, we're going back around in the cycle and it's coming back to Australia and, the, and, and you know, more localized manufacturing. That's why even big additive companies like Markforge and Formlabs are doing big pushes to be able to have localized hubs. For example, Markforge is opening up a makerspace 10 minutes down the road from this location here. People understand that manufacturing is now becoming more localized because they need to be able to manage supply chains a lot better. And that's been a yeah. problem through the pandemic. But I think that, you know, what Mark Forged and, and Formlabs are doing is great. But actually, for you, in many ways, then it's an opportunity that more people get involved in additive so that more people can come to you guys 
and start working together in the prototyping and the and the pre and the pre production phase to then scale that out and and have products that go global from there. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's been the 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 best thing to see is that I've like for example, a, a lot of the stuff we do is under NDA, so I can't talk about a lot of it. That's why I always half back. <laughs> We, this, no this, this this product here, which is from HG Performance, they came to us. They're up the road from us. They came to us and they go, "Look, we have this idea for this awesome product to to you know help you know work out your tibias." I didn't even know what a tibia was before this, by the way. Um, I also don't know what a tibia is. Could you could you elaborate? It's, it's essentially the part of your leg that it, it it's been researched that it actually contributes to shin splints. Now. Ah, I'm still a little okay. fat. I was 130 kilos back in the day and I had horrible shin splits. So when they said this, I was like, okay, absolutely. I want this. I was like, let's do it. And then we went through, so you can see that one there with the, the bar on it, that, that's a pre-production unit. And that's the current injection molded part. I've got a thousand units downstairs that we're about to deliver tomorrow. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a product that is an invention. They've got a patent on it. It's, it's an it's a invention that has come from creating that idea and then going through that you know, the four step process is changed people's lives. It, it changed mine because I, I no longer, I can go for 10K runs without shin splints. Um, and it's, it's something that is, is changing a lot of people's lives, which is awesome to see. Um, and and, it, and we do, with we do a ton of stuff, but it's, it's cool to see uh, one that's not under NDA so I can show it. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is it possible that we could take a closer look? Is, is, absolutely. Is it... I'm not sure if you can. So you can see so... this is the. Okay. This is the nylon injection molded part. Uh, this is actually, this one is, talk about additive, these are actually injection molded cores here that, that run through there. And then as well as that, wow. this is the prototype version that was done. I did this up in a day, so it's very bad. But right, you can see the, the contribution that, that it came to and, and what it ultimately turned into. Um, and That's remarkable. They really look very, very similar. Like the the, the you, you you can't tell much of the difference between them. But one is produced in... I guess, far higher quantities, right? Absolutely. So this took seven hours to print. Now, this was printed on our Stratasys F1, F123, and this takes 48 seconds. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So even to, even to produce something like this in an SLS machine, it's still going to take, you know, four or five hours. Okay. And what's the in terms of the materials between them? So the the you had the you said the SLS part was produced um in in, in what material is that? So I uh, said so that one there is is that's just an FDM print. So that was printed in ABS on the Stratasys F one two three, and then the the SLS prototypes we did were in a PA twelve, and then we did a PA eleven, uh, and then finally we ultimately settled on a PA six six glass filled uh, for the injection molding. Okay, um, so I, I think um, on that note, then, um, would you be able to just highlight in, in the context of the customer journey, like this customer came to you and they've, um, and the, uh, did they have a design in mind already? Like what was their, what was their four step process? Yeah, so they, they came to us with, they were already producing something called the ISO TIB. So these are called the ISO TIB LT. Uh, now, they came to us and said, we have this ISO TIB, it costs a lot to produce. It's, it's very difficult. It's very labor intensive to produce. Let's make something that can be able to be, you know, mass produced so we can help a lot more people. And because at the time they were having mega delays because steel, it was made out of steel. It was very big. They still make them. They're very high quality. Um, but now they were able to go and say, okay, we want to make the ISO tip LT, but we want to make it out of a high quality plastic. And then we also want to be able to add functionality to it. So the LT is only for working out your, sorry, the, the ISO tip is only for working out your tibias. The LT, I can do hip flexes, I can do, you know, a whole bunch of leg extensions. There's a whole bunch more uh, different sort of material, different exercises that you can do with this particular product. And they sort of came to us with, a, with a, a snowboard boot binding and said, we want to sort of make it look like this. And then we took the snowboard boot binding and I sort of said, well, how do we do that? And, and myself and my team, we said, okay, let's, let's see how we produce a, a part that's even better and a, and a product that is even better than the ISO tip. So we actually took uh, the snowboard binding. We sort of came up with a mock-up version uh, and that was sort of the prototype. And this, is, this was one of the earliest prototypes that we had. And we sort of, you can see this is a little bit down the track where we've got ribbing and a whole bunch of other stuff in, in built, but we took, this was one of the earlier prototypes and then we got some bindings and we said, okay, 
the 99% of the functions there or 98% of the functions there. Let's see how we go from here. Then we go, okay, let's move to the next step, which we went through, which was SLS printing, more expensive printing methods. And we got closer and closer to a final product. And then from there, we went, okay, now let's get ready for pre-production. Uh, and, and once we started getting to that pre-production phase, we looked at injection molding tooling. So this tool uh, was actually, though, though made in Australia, the tool was actually partly produced overseas. So we went overseas, we got that tool, we brought it back to Australia, and then we then finished it uh, in-house. Uh, actually, in, up in Brisbane, we finished it off and, and added all the fixtures, fittings. We, we did a whole bunch of milling. And then as well as that, um, we did some additive core stuff for, for the bottom part here to make sure that it was cooling the, the material correctly. Uh, because there was going to be warpage and a whole bunch of other things. So those few things that we did was all part of the pre-production. Then we go, okay, let's look at where we got to uh, from that. And we go, and this is, this is ready. This is ready to go. And then we clicked it. We did the first thousand. They, they sold out in about 27 minutes. They were, they were sold out in, near instantaneously. And then after that, we did have an issue with it where we had to come back and we had to add some extra ribs and things on it because it was, it was failing a few places. And you know now, or well, now I've got another thousand downstairs, and they're they're on set to produce about ten thousand this year. So, um, would you say then that the use of uh, additive helped you guys iterate faster on resolving those issues? Absolutely. I mean, so obviously, the same way that three D design helped, you know, be able to come up with the idea in three D, we were then able to near overnight print the version to again ninety nine percent of what we thought the fix was going to be, test it, and then go, okay, we're ready to go and make these modifications to this tool. Because the tool to produce this is over 1.1 ton. So to be able to take that and move it around and get it to a mill, get it to our tool room, that whole sort of situation is very expensive, no matter what you do. You've got labor costs, you've got milling, there's, there's so much to, so when we can just simply print the fix and then go, okay, that's the correct thing, it saves us going and sending a tool back and forth and back and forth and then milling a little bit. And it means that we can make one fix one time and get it right. Okay, right. So just to wrap this all up, um, if you were giving, if you could speak to, you know, uh, somebody who has a new idea for a product which they'd, like to, which they'd like to build, do you have any sort of pieces of advice that you would give them on, on how to get started and, uh, and, how, to, and how, to, uh, how to make that product into a success? Yeah, other than going to ripleydynamics.com, uh, the, <laughs> the, the best advice I can do is just, just to go out and do it. it, it it's... It, if you work, if you put a team together that knows the correct way uh, to to be able to you know go down the path, it, it makes it ten times easier because we've already walked down the path a hundred times. We we know the way. We're Google Maps for it, right? Uh, so find the people, be find the people that will be able to lead you down the right path. Because otherwise, you're going to do what I did and then just blow up a whole bunch of printers or you know go and go, go and blow. Up. I've only blown up one injection molding machine, but you know, go and, and break a lot of eggs. Nice. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kalani. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Harry. Cheers, mate.